Hi, everyone, and welcome to January 2024. So it's Darren and Christian, and today we're going to be taking you through a review of last year, kind of what markets did and how we tried to position in the face of all that change. And then we're going to set the table for what we think might be unfolding in 2024 and what we're getting ready for. So with that, Christian, welcome to today's show. Thanks, Darren. Excited to get to it. Perfect. Before we begin, two quick announcements for everybody. The first one is really happy to announce that today we've opened our office in Vancouver. So we've got a place there so that Katie and Ryan have a place to go because they've been working out of their own apartments and kitchens and things for the last few years. So we've got a space for them and we'll be shortly updating our website. Uh, it's, it's quite a nice spot. It's right in downtown Vancouver in the financial district. So really pleased to announce the opening of that. And then the second announcement is uh, about you, Christian. You've been busy uh, taking the level two course for the Chartered Financial Analyst designation, which is a global designation, very hard to get. There's three levels for it, and you've just completed the second of three. And uh, you graduated in the top 95th percentile or something like that of, of all writers globally. So uh, well done. Congratulations on accomplishing that milestone. Thanks, Darren. Appreciate it. Yeah, we're very proud of you, and we look forward to you being done it and getting a... Because you needed more letters after your name behind, besides Master of uh, Accounting and, and CPA, mm -hmm. and so we need a few more for you. So congratulations. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we're going to put some of that stuff to work today. You've been busy um, uh, putting some charts and slides together, and we've reviewed, I think, some of the key pieces of information and insight we wanted to share with everybody. So um, I'm going to let you fly the machine. You guys don't let me touch the computer very often. So if you wouldn't mind just kind of taking us to maybe our beginning, which is reviewing what happened last year. Yep. And first, a word from our lawyers, of course. Um, yep. Objects are closer than they appear and three out of four dentists agree. So that's great. Well, I, I thought a great place to start is actually in, in looking back and, and seeing mm -hmm. how 2023 uh, was for the markets. And, and the great place to look is, is how did the overall market perform? How did S&P 500 sectors perform throughout the year? Uh, it was actually a great year for the market. It was up over 26% on the year. Uh, mostly, though, we can see in, in the black highlighted box here, it was driven by three main sectors, consumer discretionary, tech, and communication services, which respectively were each up over 40% on the year. Most other sectors, they were treading water throughout the year. And then the fourth quarter happened and they had quite outsized gains. You could see that most predominantly in financials and real estate, which if it wasn't for the fourth quarter of last year, they would have actually ended the year negative. So it was a bit of a mixed basket, but overall the market as a whole did quite well. And when we talk about certain sectors performing well, really what's driven the market this year has been about seven to 10 stocks. Uh, on the chart on the left here, we see the performance of the 10 stocks in the S&P 500, so that's top 10 by market weight, and they drove 86% of the total return last year. They returned an average of 62% across the 10 stocks. The remaining S&P 500, so the other 490 names, they returned an average of 8%, which contributed to 14% of that 26% return. So certainly a lot of disparity in the market in terms of what drove returns throughout the year. If you were equal weight or you had some diversification across your baskets, certainly you weren't capturing the extent of outsized outperformance from those top 10 stocks. When we look at that a, a little further, uh, and on the right side of this chart, we see that the weight of the top 10 stocks in the S&P 500 is the highest it's been in over three decades. It's over 32% right now. And that comes in spite their share of earnings contribution being only 23%. So a lot of what's been driven this year in those top 10s has been a lot of multiple expansion rather than earnings expansion, even though it did tick up uh, a little bit throughout the year. So let's just dive into that for one second, because this is a really, yeah. really important thing for people to be aware of is how top heavy. And we've talked about this. I've talked about this for years, that this is becoming a problem. And when we talk about multiple expansion, really what we mean by that is um, it's not the fact that the earnings are jumping up like crazy. It's what are people willing to pay? for those earnings. So people seem to be willing to concentrate their bets and it's happening both through individual decision making to buy Tesla or Nvidia, but it's also by the way that things like index funds are created because they're basically structured so that the biggest company gets the most money. Every time a dollar goes in, more gets allocated to those bigger stocks. So it has this momentum effect where the big just keep getting bigger. Mm 
And that becomes really a problem for people like us that want to manage risk because risk is now getting consolidated to a smaller and smaller number of businesses. And as we can see from the earnings contribution, people are willing to pay up even though the companies aren't making the level of money that they thought. So this is becoming, I think, very dangerous that people are zeroing in on just a few slot machines in Vegas and hopefully they keep on paying out. The problem, as we'll see in a minute, is that that momentum effect that drives that narrowness up, it also reverses hard, which is also a problem because if the people start to sell, especially index fund players, they start to sell, the biggest get sold the most first. So this acceleration effect that worked on the way up also works in reverse. So we have to be really, really mindful of kind of where we're allocating capital and what's kind of below the surface. So even though the index looks like it's up a lot, it's not, as you mentioned earlier, this broad base is just a few. We've been really, we own some of that stuff, but we don't dump all of our money into that. And I think as Canadians, we're mindful of what happened with Nortel and JDS Uniphase when we had a similar effect back in the late 90s, and it didn't end well. So we want to be very aware of this. And I'm glad you also pointed out that Last year, the wider um, uh, universe of companies, especially things we like, like financials and real estate that tend to pay out all the time, they only really showed up when Santa showed up. So you had to be very patient last year. So a bit of a challenging year to navigate through. And uh, why don't we also now move to that concept of valuation? What are people willing to pay? Because you can be right on your idea, but wrong on your price, as we'll give a really bold example in a second. Yeah, and as a as a just a brief comment there, um, just as a demonstration, is is the equal weighted index. You can see that we have a very large and uncommon divergence between equal weighted and broad equity markets. So that just is a further testament to what we've just been speaking about. And, and speaking then against valuation, we saw that the average top ten was trading around twenty six point nine times. Uh, the underlying S and P five hundred on a market weighted basis, we can see is trading at 19.5 times at the end of the year. And, and that's at the higher end of its historical average. It's trading about one standard deviation above of where it typically has traded over the last 30 years. And there's capacity for the multiple expansion to continue. We see that in the late 90s. We've seen that in, in the COVID pandemic where you can trade well above one standard deviation of the norm, but eventually there is a regression back to the mean. And so that's something we're very mindful of in, in speaking of value and entry points is the price that we're paying for uh, entities that we're purchasing within our portfolios. And Darren, I, I think you have an example from your past here that you'd like to highlight. Yeah, and before we go to that, I just want to make sure everybody understands when we talk about this times thing, what we mean by that. So the price to earnings is for every dollar of earnings, how many years of that are you willing to pay for? So when we talk about some of these tech stocks having earnings that are 30 and 40 and 50 times, it means you're willing to pay for 30 or 40 years of current earnings right now. So that's expensive, right? And this graph we're showing kind of also demonstrates that dominance of just those few large tech companies skewing the numbers. So we've used this chart historically to give us some sense of our people, is it expensive or cheap? Where are we? And right now, because of that concentration, it's making the numbers look like the index is getting more expensive. But again, we want to be mindful of that's just some. There's lots of other opportunity where I don't think people are favoring the bet. Now, yeah, if, let's go to that example of um, what happens when you can be right in your idea but wrong on your price. And I want to take people back to the late 90s when this internet thing was becoming like, ooh, this is really cool. And if you made a bet back in the late 90s that the internet was going to be a big deal, um, you were more right than you turned out than you could have imagined because that's the reason we can do all this stuff now is because back in the late 90s you had companies building out the, the highway for the information superhighway, to use an old term, uh, that we all use today. And if you believed in that vision back in the late 90s and you were more right than you thought, one of the leading companies to invest in was Cisco Systems because they built all the switches and the data gear and everything else to make the internet work. So if you bought them back in the late 90s, you were as I say, more right than you could have imagined on what's going to happen with the internet. And Cisco over time has done quite well as a business. That's not the problem. The problem is what did you pay for that stock? Because you have the business, then what people wish to pay for it. And as you can see from this graph, if you bought at the late 90s, here we are almost 25 years, well, 25 years later, and Cisco is still worth less 
on a share price basis than it was in the late 90s. You're still behind. And you can see what happens with that little bit of mania where everyone gets the same idea. And you could argue maybe that things like AI are getting all this attention today. There's this huge serve as, as everyone chases popularity. But as you should have learned in high school, popularity isn't everything. And very quickly, the, the tide reverts and crash down that stock comes. Now, again, great business. Business did great. But as a buyer of the stock, because the stock is not the business, they're connected, but they're not the same thing, um, turned out to be a bit of a failure as a long-term investment. So we want to be very mindful of not just the underlying business qualities we're buying into, but what's the price people are willing to pay. And as you've done the math on that, Christian, uh, anyone who bought Cisco who's been waiting for it to get back to where it was, 25 years later is still 26% below what the top price was. So got to be careful. Got to be careful. Okay, so that's little blast from the past. Um, and let's jump ahead to maybe some economic numbers to give us that backdrop. Yeah. And, and so when we speak about um, market concentration, I think it's also important to put into context why the markets actually ended up performing better as a whole than they did. And there's a couple key factors that we would like to highlight. One, and we, we've spoken about this in prior presentation, is the extent of excess pandemic savings that were built up uh, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, as people were unable to spend to the capacity they usually do, and fiscal programs continue to support the consumer, well, all that savings built up really kept consumers afloat throughout the year. And they've drawn down about three-fourths of the excess savings built up. But with consumption remaining a lot sturdier than most had anticipated, uh, that coincided with the economy surprising to the upside throughout the year. So going into 2023, uh, economic expectations were notably bad. Uh, people were expecting quite dire circumstances, but with consumption uh, keeping its ground and the consumer continuing to be strong, uh, economic surprises and GDP growth was quite robust. And now we're seeing it finally start to tail over towards the end of the year as economic expectations continue to be revised upward. Eventually things happen to be in line with expectations. So, from the chart, we see we're at a, a very poor level. We ended up at a very great level, and, and now we're just kind of back towards the middle. Another key factor in this discussion is really the inflation narrative. And what we've actually been experiencing towards most of this year, and, and especially uh, coming through in the last quarter of the year, is some semblance of disinflation. So inflation has started to roll over. We can see it's certainly not at its peaks as it was coming out of 2021 and 2022. And a large portion of that is because our supply chains are back to normal. Uh, on good side, inflation has really returned back to its pre-pandemic levels as supply chains got back up into full force and certainly a lot of those cost side pressures were reduced. So now what we're left with is really what we call this last mile of the inflation battle. And a lot of it's driven by service sector inflation and that's certainly something that we're gonna get to a little bit later on today because we think it has the potential to remain just a little bit stickier than most anticipate to get us back towards that 2% target. Yeah, and this is really, I think, important that we pay attention to this because if you remember, just go back through some of the news headlines, people, from from last year is that we were worried about the massive state of inflation. We were seeing 8 and 9% inflation rates. People are very worried about that. That we, we had a video I did, I'll put a link up here about some of the things we worry about inflation. Um, and that seems to have backed off quite a bit, which we were aware of that it would, it would peak, and it would decline as it's done. That would let interest rates start to fall a little bit, or at least people think interest rates are gonna start falling a little bit. Um, but also there was a lot of talk just as a matter of a couple of months ago about recession. And we don't really see that in the news anymore. And I keep reminding people, don't watch the financial news. It's like untreated waste. Don't watch it. You're only allowed to watch BNN if I'm on, and I haven't been on in years. So um, the talk about recession and everything else, if you were pessimistic last year, you were completely wrong. You just had to be patient. So what we did to give kind of the broad strokes of how we managed through that was we didn't give in to that pessimistic view. We maintained our U.S. equity exposure because we still think that's the best house on the street. Uh, and we actually increased it a little bit and were able to buy in. Oh, I dropped my pen. We were able to buy in a little bit as values were low, especially in the outside of the AI and tech areas. Um, we also realized that interest rates, I thought, were going to crest because inflation numbers were becoming better, which meant we should start to see interest rates, if not decline, at least the view that they're going to rise will stop. 
So we added more to our credit and accessed some alternative credit. I think we have to be very smart as lenders. So we've made sure we've adopted those in the portfolios to lock in good kind of guaranteed and fixed yields in the portfolio. Um, and then we also added traditional bonds as well, which is something we've been very, very light on for a long time. Uh, indeed, this was the first time in over a decade where we made some substantial increases to our fixed income allocation. And that was important that we did that because we didn't do it for a long time because interest rates were low and going up. Bonds do badly in that environment. We were exactly right. We avoided the worst year of the bond market it's had in history, so good for us. And then we decided to allocate when it looked like the rates were reasonable. So that's paid off nicely. And these are just big macro calls we made. Um, where we didn't do very well was we, had, we stuck to the discipline of remaining diversified. You know, if I'd had a time machine, I'd go back and put it all on those seven stocks, which you don't do. That's a terrible idea. Um, but as it turned out, you know, that was, you know, there's a joke in our business that sometimes the dumbest guy in the room makes all the money. So last year, you know, doing the opposite of good sense of just loading up on the winners. But that, again, is like knowing what hand you're going to get playing blackjack or which slot machine is going to pay up. You can't do that. So we maintained our diversified view. Historically, that's always worked. But last year, it was better to maybe zero in on a couple things and cross your fingers. But we don't do that here. So that's a bit of an overview of kind of how we navigated through, in a broad strokes, 2023. And speaking to your last point, Darren, uh, diversification still matters. Uh, this chart may look like a mismatch of colors, and that's because it really emphasizes that no one asset class consistently outperforms the rest of the market. Um, you can see throughout the years here that the leading asset class was actually quite different. And so that just emphasizes from our point of view the need to be diversified across asset classes and, and within asset classes. And actually, and, and, here's a fun, here's, sorry to interrupt, Chris, but here's a fun yeah. game people can play. Go back to that slide for a second. Um, I'm going to ask you if you're watching this on YouTube, just hit pause. And what I want you to do is look at all those categories and you can see there which you know categories and how they performed every year. I want you to freeze frame this, spend a few minutes and identify some of the major patterns that we see in here. OK, so go ahead and do that now. OK, welcome back. I'm assuming you paused it. Uh, and what you would have taken away from that is there really isn't any pattern. It's almost constantly random. Yeah, there's places where REITs have outperformed over a lot. That's why we are big real estate investors. But you can see how in 2021 that worked out really well. And then 2022, you're like, I wish I never heard of these darn things. So this is one of the reasons why we don't zero in on one area, because you can be a hero one year and a zero the next. And what seems to work the best is this asset allocation mix, right? A little bit of everything. Because um, I've always believed that in investing and trying to reach your goals, it's better to be mostly right than really wrong. And so that's it. So I, my joke also is that we invest like I wish I could play golf. Just try and hit it down the middle. And it's not exciting, but it works. So that's a great graph, Christian. Thanks for putting that one up there. Or good chart. Yeah, and, and no problem. And, and I think that lends nicely to this point here. And, and it speaks to if you're willing to assume just one asset class, you also have to assume the volatility and drawdowns that can come with being so heavily concentrated. And from this chart here, we can see that in, in any one given year, uh, the drawdowns can be quite extensive, even though the equity market may have ended quite positively. And, and Darren, we've spoken about this quite extensively in terms of the importance of risk adjusted returns and when making asset allocation decisions to have comfort with the volatility that you're assuming. Yeah, and I think we're going to take this away and maybe record our own little Commonwealth Academy video on how volatility matters because we're seeing a lot of things in the press. And this always seems to happen whenever one sector or one index does really well. People are like, well, why don't I just buy that? and call it a day, right? Why don't I just do that? And I'm, Well, the problem is, is that you don't have any shock absorbers. Like this is like getting on the plane and never doing up your seatbelt. And if you want the long-term return of the S&P 500, you also have to accept the volatility, the bounciness of it. And so look at all those years where things were down by 13, down by 20, down by 10, down by 49, down by 34. That's the ride. And unless you can tolerate watching 30% plus of your money disappear in a year, you're not going to get this upside. And this is why things like 
Dalbar and, and other comp um, companies that measure investor success discover that most people never get all the upside of their investments because they jump out at the wrong time. So what we try to do is get most of the upside and not nearly as much of the downside. And I think we've had a history of being able to accomplish that. So again, we're going to take that way and maybe run a separate video just on how we try to manage that to get not everyone worries about investment return. I worry a lot about investor return. What did we actually accomplish as investors? So again, we, the S&P 500, yeah, it's easy to buy, hard to own hard to own. So we try to manage the risk of that. So, okay, another great chart, Christian. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And, and so having looked at 2023, um, now it's time to look ahead to 2024. And no better place to start than seeing where do the, all the top strategists on the street think we're going to end up this year? Well, if you could transpose this chart on a bell curve, you'll end up with quite heavy tails, because the range of outcomes here is very extensive. And Consensus is really not easily found. Uh, and, and so... And by the way, we read, we read all these things through the year, right? Like yeah. Especially at the beginning of the year to get a sense of where does everybody think. And there's no one's right all the time. And the range of where people think it's going to be is almost comical, right? Like to the point where it's somewhat useless. We just look for themes and things that we can buy into. But trying to pick a number, just pick one and then see if it makes sense. But uh, yeah, there's no one has a consensus on this, that's for sure. Yeah, and, and further to your point, Darren, we, we do look at these things, and uh, it, it's so difficult to forecast because if we look at last year, uh, this is funny, the average yeah. strategist was returning 4% going into the year. S&P, as we just discussed, ended up doing a total return of 26.3%. So while there was broadly more optimism going into the year, certainly no leading publication, no leading uh, asset manager predicted anywhere close to the returns that we achieved in 2023. And whoever and so, was at BNP Paribas, wow, they may not have a job today. Um, which, by the way, is something people should know, that, that uh, the analysts and the economy, they generally are more bullish because nobody wants to get fired. Again, be mostly right, not really wrong. So whoever made that really, really strong call last year, it's almost like flipping a coin. You're either a hero again or a zero. So, um, so yeah, looking at the success rate of this, your weatherman is often more accurate than the strategists are. Yeah, and so that leads us into, you know, there is a lot of uncertainty across uh, Wall Street going into the year, but what can we discern from this noise, as we mentioned earlier, managing through the noise? And, and part of that is this concept of a landing. Uh, so that is, are we going to end up in a recession? Or are we not going to end up in a recession? And so really, one key place to start is, well, market participants, the probability of recession going to the U.S., so this chart on the far left. As Darren mentioned, going throughout 2023 and especially following the banking crisis in May and into March, uh, from March into May, uh, the sentiment got very poor and the probability of recession is almost up to 60% uh, across main market participants in the U.S. Now, having ended the year, uh, we can see this has come down quite considerably and only about 30% of the average market participants and dealers are expecting a recession. So sentiment has broadly become more positive. But there are still underlying indicators on the surface that give us some pause. So from this Clearbridge recession risk dashboard here, which examines a bevy of leading indicators that have historically pre-told a recession, uh, you can see that most are still in recessionary or cautionary territory. So there are still indicators under the surface that lead us to have a little bit of caution going into the year, despite the broad increase in sentiment. And Another key area that we're looking at is the labor picture. So as we mentioned, good side inflation has largely normalized and labor has become more into focus. Labor, as we can see here, is also beginning to normalize. Uh, openings and quits rate have started to come down. Thankfully, layoffs and the unemployment rate has remained quite low. But we also are quite mindful in, in monitoring you know, what happens once openings come down to the level that is sufficient for these companies. Because if openings come down as far as they can get, so back to pre-pandemic levels, the next step for employers is to cut headcount. They can no longer cut any openings. And so once you start cutting headcount, of course, then unemployment goes up, and that could be a predisposition to growth slowing. So we're very carefully monitoring the labor markets and seeing if we can actually achieve this soft landing, whereby we reduce job openings, but we don't eventually increase unemployment. 
So now let's turn our eyes to, we talked about labor and, and labor markets and incomes. Let's actually now look at credit, because this has been a really interesting space uh, during the pandemic and coming out of it. Well, I had all that excess savings. No one could really buy what they want. You couldn't get a boat. You couldn't get a new car. You know, you couldn't get someone to put a pool in or whatever people are spending it on. Um, but now what's happened with, with credit has been very interesting as the world reopened. So could you take us through these charts, please? Yeah, so... As Darren mentioned, credit growth actually picked up quite a bit uh, coming out of the pandemic once people could spend again. But as we know, interest rates have increased substantially, and we'll show you a nice chart here just showing how... Which seems to have surprised everybody, including our yeah. central bankers and politicians who said, hey, rates will stay low, keep borrowing, right? Oops. Exactly. And, and so with that uh, increase in interest rates, uh, lending standards, which is the propensity for... Uh, U.S. financial institutions to lend to consumers, to businesses, those have tightened significantly. And those shaded areas on this chart are, are recessionary periods. And so as we can see here, when lending standards tighten to the extent they have, uh, typically that's a negative to growth. And in coinciding with this increase in, in, in tightening in lending standards, uh, delinquencies of sort of defaults are on the rise for certain loan categories. So within the commercial mortgage-backed uh, security market uh, office, which has been a very heavily publicized sector, uh, we see a very large increase in defaults over the last few quarters. But even in looking at the consumer and the health of the consumer, uh, mortgage delinquencies have remained quite low, but credit and auto loan delinquencies we can see have experienced a very sharp uptick. And certainly those are the actually first loan categories that you typically see defaults before you see any underlying stress on home loans. So we give to have some pause given our overview of the weakening credit and lending environment. Um, this is quite common in the US and also across other developed economies such as Canada and Europe. But Darren, there's also, you know, one of the things that we've looked at and, and certainly with a lot of renewed focus following the March SVB crisis is that unrealized losses continue to mount for financial institutions. And this is a really interesting spot because if we think back, people may remember about a year ago, we had this big run on Silicon Valley Bank and some other things. And part of the problem was the banks had invested into government bonds that had a longer maturity. And again, when interest rates are low and they rise, those bonds lose value in, in the, what's called a mark to market. So if you say, I've got to sell it today, what do I get for it? And so suddenly their balance sheets were really weak because suddenly the bonds were worth a lot less. And so if they hold them to maturity, they'll get their money back. They'll get the right value. But in the meantime, it can be a problem. So when we look across the bank balance sheets, there's a lot of these unrealized losses that if they can hold those securities, as you can see, those black bars, they'll be OK. But we've also got other securities that are their values might be a lot different. Real estate being one of them, office towers and things like that. They aren't worth what they were on the books when interest rates were at 1% than they are at 5%. So um, this is a little bit of a rock under the surface of the water here about what are these potential losses going to do. And the good news is um, that the regulator, everyone kind of knows this, but nobody knows what to do about this. Yeah, so certainly those are a few areas that we continue to be mindful of and are, and are watching despite as I mentioned, a broad increase in sentiment. So we're, we're obviously very cognizant of the range of outcomes that are possible for the economy. And, and speaking about range of outcomes, it's also important to examine what is the possible path for U.S. interest rates. So here, you know, it really shows the disparity in between what the market has been pricing and what the Federal Reserve is pricing. The, the sharp blue, dark blue line is the Federal Reserve expectations for interest rates coming into next year. They're expecting about three cuts next year. The market is pricing over seven. And they're saying that there's gonna be cut at every meeting starting in March. So that velocity in rate cuts is historically not actually been very positive for markets because it's the need to quickly loosen monetary policy is typically coincided with a slowdown in growth or recession. So it, it, there's a little bit of dysfunction in the market certainly. Earnings growth is forecast to increase on average by about 12% next year and credit spreads are the tightest they've been in over two years in the U.S. So there are things that are within the market and inconsistencies that we believe will need to rectify themselves. But another key area I think is, is also important to highlight is the volatility of interest rates. So again, we've, we've talked about this, but coming out of the GFC, 
we were uh, blessed in a sense by extremely accommodative monetary policy and ultra low interest rates. And we can see how rapid the rise has been within the last couple of years. And that's added tremendous volatility, not only to the bond markets, but also to the equity markets because uncertainty creates volatility. And it's not only in the US that we've seen this rise. We can look across uh, the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, the Euro area. Again, following a very long period of ultra low rates, and that's not the historical norm, uh, we can see that now we're starting to have a better picture of, you know, maybe rates have peaked and they're starting to roll over. We could expect some cuts. But again, it's the velocity of cuts, the pace of cuts that remain a key market question. And, and certainly we don't think right now that the market is appropriately reacting to what the central banks are telling them and that the pace of cuts is not going to be as great as they expect. We think maybe it's a little bit overdone. And certainly we've seen that a little bit in the last few weeks here where interest rates have come back a little bit following the end of the quarter. So having uh, looked through our outlook on rates, and, and you know, this here is an illustration from Vanguard, which is one of the largest asset allocators in the world. And, and certainly our forecasts and, and uh, ability to determine rates is quite similar. But it's also important to think about Canada and, and back, bringing it back home to the domestic market. So this is a little bit tongue in cheek, O Canada, as we're very familiar with our national anthem. Uh, but there are a few key structural factors that give us a little bit of pause when we're looking back home to the Great White North. So, I think we need to change our uh, national anthem to our home on borrowed land or borrowed money for land because this is a problem that, again, everybody knows, but nobody knows what to do about it. And this is all the mortgage journals. I'm glad you found this chart because we've heard this in the press but it's really important we quantify it so people can see what might be coming. Yeah, exactly. There is 48% of mortgages are expected to renew by 2026. Uh, that is an extensive amount of mortgages that are coming for renewal that were at low interest rates and now you're looking to renew at four or five, six percent. And certainly that's gonna add a lot of stress uh, that's already existing on the consumer because now a larger portion of their income is gonna to go towards mortgage payments. They're not gonna be able to spend as they have in the past on discretionary items. So that's something that we're very mindful of. Uh, the other thing that uh, you know, is good to highlight here is, is the chart on the right, which is the uh, business survey within Canada. And so this business barometer surveys the conf uh, confidence of businesses' performance amongst its owners and executives. So where they think their business will be in the near future. And we can see that really that confidence has rolled over quite extensively the last few months. And it's typically a leading indicator for where GDP growth is headed. So if, if historical correlations continue to play a role, uh, certainly the outlook in the near term for Canadian uh, economic growth is not very positive. There are also a couple longer term issues that we think need to be solved uh, within the Canadian economy. Um, you know, we discussed earlier how difficult it is to get strategists to come to, to consensus. Uh, recently, the Economic Club of Canada held its annual breakfast with the leading economists of each major Canadian bank. And each of them wholeheartedly agreed that Canada has issues that need to be solved. And, and one of those key issues is the uh, surge in population in our immigration policy. So as we can see here, it, the chart looks out of scale, but it, it's not. Uh, 2021 and 2022, we had an unprecedented rise in our population. Over 1 million people came into our country or, or our population grew by over 1 million people. A lot of that came from immigration. And the National Bank believes that our, our annual population growth to sustain uh, GDP growth, it should only be around 300 to 500,000. So certainly our, our current population immigration policies are not doing us any flavors. and. When we have such a large surge in population, the next question naturally that one would ask is, where do we house all these people? Well, that's another key issue. You know, we are right now in a historic housing supply deficit within the Canadian economy. There is simply not enough houses for the amount of people that we have. And shelter makes up one third of our CPI, CPI basket. So our inability to provide affordable housing, to provide supply of housing, uh, certainly has a uh, potential to keep inflation elevated. And a large part that we kind of understand of why that surge happened are 
you know, students, uh, international students coming in, foreign temporary workers and other things. So, so I think the key thing is, is that this rapidly, you know, we look at the data and then it becomes a political issue for sure. And this is something that, as I think people can see from the numbers, there's a reason why rents have surged um, and, and it's becoming very problematic across the board. And it's, it's not a question of is immigration good, it is. It's, I think, the pace of it. And, and as we've seen in other places, massive changes in one direction or the other cause lots of disruptions and disturbances. So this one's pretty historic, and, and it, we're going to have to see what the policy responses are. But clearly, something needs to be done to address these issues. So that's that's now. By the way, we're also um, as investors much more bullish on the U.S. than on Canada because some of these factors are going to lead to policy responses or ought to that might be pretty drastic. I think that's why that consensus for the Canadian outlook is is deteriorating as opposed to improving. So um, again, if the facts change, will change. But at the moment, um, the pattern of Canada's GDP decline, and I'll let you take us through this in a second, I think it's intact. It's, and I hate to say that as a Canadian, um, but it's not getting better. Yeah, as you mentioned, Darren, like right now, uh, just plainly put, Canada doesn't have enough savings to stabilize what's known as our capital to labor ratio, so we can't actually in, uh, achieve an increase in our GDP per capita. And, and we see that quite clear on the chart to the left that you know, we at one point we were ahead and in line with the United States, but over the last two decades, we've really fallen behind not only the U.S. but our uh, peers in other developed economies. And the National Bank recently attested to this fact and said that Canada is in a population trap for its first time in modern history. On top of this, we can see that Canada has really failed to invest in in research and development. So that's led us to fall behind in our ability to innovate, our ability to enhance the productivity of our economy. And so we, we just continue to be mindful of some of these structural issues. Of course, on the domestic side, as we build domestic portfolios and, and look to the Canadian market, we continue to try to source out the best in class companies to lead us through this time. But on a broader sense, as Darren mentioned, uh, we do have some preference to the U.S. given some of these structural challenges. Okay, and then why don't we look, we talk about interest rates quite a bit and how the volatility of interest rates has really changed the backdrop. It's like being a sailor and the wind is constantly moving around. It's hard to stay on course with one minute it's behind you, then it's on your beam and then it's coming at you. Um, but there might be some good news coming from this chart. Yeah, exactly. And we've titled this a new equilibrium, but I guess it may be the right right word would be maybe a not so new but returned old equilibrium because as i mentioned you know the last 10 years uh, ultra low rates but it, it's it's something that's really not uncommon throughout economic history interest rates were generally higher than they have been and we think that there are actually a few structural factors that will lead us to have a higher average interest rate uh, than we've had in the past so Obviously, there's near-term uh, volatility in rates. We, as we mentioned, you can debate the extent that rates are cut in the short term. But ultimately, we see them settling at a higher level than they have in the last decade. Uh, things such as an increased rate of investment relative to savings, uh, you know, populations continue to age, which is a big uh, factor within that. Government borrowing, which we'll get to, continues to rise. Um, there's also a possibility for increased productivity on a global level, uh, because of AI and other technologies and, and green technology expansion. So there are several factors that we think will lead us to have higher interest rates going into the future. And as Darren, I know what we've also spoken about is it's key not to anchor to what we've known right. and experienced, right? And so maybe you can just touch on that a little bit further. Yeah, I would actually hope that we can get to a point where central bankers and governments just quit messing with the machines so much. I've always believed that government should try to walk a really fine line between as much as necessary and as little as possible. And I would really love a politician to come in and say, I'm going to actually do less than the last person because I think messing with the machine causes lots of unintended consequences. So on this chart, I really hope we do get to a point where rates stay fairly stable because then people can plan, companies can plan. It's a lot easier to navigate in the world if you know bonds or interest rates are going to be about 4 or 5% instead of 18 or zero or one that's really complicated and this anchoring thing i've noticed this is that depending on kind of when you bought your house that is what makes you think interest rates ought to be so if you're a baby boomer and you remember paying 16 or 18 percent for your mortgage then you remember that's where it went you try and tell a millennial that today they're like that's not even possible what do you mean and you're like no no i i had that i had the statement from the bank so their sensitivity to high interest rates they they went through that 
you take a Gen X like me and, you know, you, when you bought your first house, your mortgage was probably around four and a half, five and a half percent. So we think, yeah, a five percent interest rate environment. I did that. That's kind of normal. One percent was too low. Eighteen is too high. Five seems about right. It's nice and Goldilocks. You take a millennial that bought a house in the last few years, if they were able to find one, they're shocked that their mortgage rate went over two percent. Like, what are you talking about? It was one or two for so. How is it five? I'm alarmed. I'm panicked by five or six percent or seven. Like what? So it's interesting how people, depending on kind of where they had their first home buying experience with their mortgage, was, that's what they think normal is. And it aligns to something else. I once heard someone say that the best music you've ever heard is what you heard in high school. So it's kind of a generational thing. Um, but I hope that we can create an environment where rates stay fairly normalized and, and a four percent, five percent rate for a long term, that would settle a lot of things out. Now, clearly, you can't often manage for that, but I'm hopeful we get into an environment where a lot of this pulling the stick kind of by the central bankers begins to flatten out. So fingers crossed. But I just want to point that out about how rates have moved. The volatility has caused lots of um, problems in terms of how people decide. But also think about your own biases as an investor of whatever you think rates are. It's probably that's what you, the rate you had on your first mortgage. And, and, and I touched upon this just briefly, and I think it's an important topic that we delve a little bit further into, and that's fiscal spending continues to rise. So chart on the left is the uh, total outlays by the U.S. government um, from 20, 2000 to 2028 projection in trillions of dollars. And we can see a very steep and upward trajectory. Uh, this chart, if you looked at Canada, if you looked at Europe, very similar uh, developed economies continue to increase the amount of fiscal spending they have and the amount of borrowing that those governments need. And we talked about what happens if the interest rates ultimately settle at a higher level than they have been at the past. Well, uh, quite simply put, the extent of government borrowing and fiscal spending is unsustainable. And that could lead to austerity. Now, it's not necessarily a near-term issue, but this is something that we're going to continue to monitor over the coming years because we think it could lead to issues just given how much spending is actually required on things such as Medicare, the green energy transition, geopolitical conflicts remain a key area of focus, which we're going to touch on in just a second. And so it's unlikely that this spending will slow anytime soon, which leads us into a higher probability event that eventually this is going to come around to rear its head and not in the nicest way. And so, yeah, speaking of, and sorry, yeah. and by the way, this is a problem because at the moment, I don't see any major political group anywhere saying we're going to start slowing down the credit card spending. Um, like we've had a lot of people asking us what we think might happen in the U.S. election that's coming up. It, it almost doesn't matter from my perspective because both parties are going to keep spending. It's just on what, right, what their priorities are. But no one's slowing down the spending. No one seems to be really, really worried about this. Um, but this is going to be something that I think future uh, electorates are going to have to contend with. And if they don't, the bond market and the, and the currency market, they'll do it for you. Because any country that's kind of not paid attention to this ultimately pays a hell of a price. And actually, if you want to see what that means, just look at Argentina and what they're going through, because they ran into this wall where they just they had lots of resources and opportunity and they just outspent what they could afford. And now where are they? So might be a bit of a template for what might be coming ahead of us. But um, this is why I think it's extremely important for you as an individual investor, as a client, to manage your own financial affairs because they're not doing a great job with their household. So your budget better be pretty intact. Yeah. And, and you touched on that just briefly, but you know, the U.S. obviously has a very highly publicized election this year, but there's actually the largest election year on record. There's over 4 billion people voting, including elections in India, and we just had one recently in Taiwan. And on top of that, you know, if you turn on your and TV, maybe day, Canada, we don't know. Like we could we could go to the polls any time in Canada because we have a minority government. So who knows? Yep. And, and, you know, if you turn on your TV d these days, it, it's hard not to miss all the other geopolitical conflict going on across the world. We have tensions uh, in the Middle East right now rearing their head again. Uh, Russia, Ukraine obviously remains a key area of focus. And we had the threat of escalation from China and Taiwan. And we also have other issues in the Middle East, especially in Israel and Palestine. So the extent of geopolitical conflict uh, across the world, and we can see from this chart, is at a very heightened level. And outside of the COVID pandemic, it's not one that we've seen since the early 2000s. And of course, that was 9-11 and the impending uh, wars in the Middle East. So geopolitical conflict remains extremely elevated. Uh, economic uncertainty remains elevated. 
And, you know, these, it's very difficult to manage around these black swan events, but Darren, you have a really unique perspective because this chart, I think, dates back to when you started managing money yeah. and you've been through these multiple elections and geopolitical conflicts. Yeah, I started in the, in the industry in 1982, so that chart is my career. So there's never been a quiet day. Um, so one of the things, and it's interesting we talk about this, because I just had a, a, a client ask me, a new client ask me um, this morning, they said, kind of, could you just take us through, because we're new to you, how do you kind of manage through these black swan events? And I'm glad, I, and I'll put a link up here to the video we did um, a couple years ago when uh, Russia first invaded Ukraine, and it's amazing that that conflict isn't over yet. Um, but I, I talked about how we manage through periods of market turmoil and how we don't do panic here. And so again, the link's up there. So go and have a watch of it. And I kind of go over some of the major, you know, black swan events. It seems like they're, they're come around with such regularity, but you never know what they are and how they're going to manifest themselves. So, so I don't think we try to manage for what's remotely possible. We try to aim for what's highly probable and what strategies tend to work the best because you cannot predict, no one can predict any of this stuff. So you have to go back to what are your disciplines about invest in quality businesses and quality fixed income. Don't buy junk. It may look appealing because it's cheap, but don't buy it. Stick with quality. You know, I, as a, uh, when we buy companies, we try to buy companies that can set price. They're leaders in their category, so they can maintain margins and pass along rising costs. Really important during inflation. Um, for better or worse, we have to stay diversified. And there's years where it completely saves us. There's years like last year where, nah, we should have thrown that away and just concentrated on a few popular ideas. But historically, that's not smart. So we try to stick to the disciplines because there's no one strategy that works every day, but if you apply these, these concepts and you, and you learn how to do them with discipline, then you're right over all of the days. And that's really what we're trying to do. Again, mostly right instead of really wrong. So um, you can see the pace of these events seems to be coming faster. I would also argue that the, the connectedness of the internet allows us to see this because it used to be that when you heard the news, it was local and you're worried about what thing happened in your neighborhood. Now you turn on the news or Twitter or just sends it to your phone and you see the worst thing that happened in the world right now, even if you can't do anything about it. So the stress of this uh, is something we're all going to have to kind of learn to manage a little bit. And certainly with respect to portfolios, staying disciplined is probably the number one thing I've learned to do in the last 32 years. Thanks for pointing out how well I am, Christian. I appreciate that. So, and we'll just keep doing that. Perfect. Okay, so I think that's the end of our charts today. So thank you everybody for watching. If you have any questions about any of the stuff or you'd like us to go over any other information, please let us know. Um, one of the things I've asked Christian to do for this year is maybe kind of do a little 10 minute version of these maybe every month as we see a particular news headline or piece of data. Maybe we can kind of you know decode a little bit for you. So when we hear about soft landing, hard landing, like what does that mean? Because one of the things I've noticed is that um, people, I think the way the financial press keeps sending this stuff is people feel like I should be more educated on this than I actually am. So we'll try to demystify this, but also give you some of our insight in terms of what the press is telling and how do we kind of, what do we do about it? In some cases it's nothing, but I think you should know that. So, so Christian, that's something I'm gonna task you with is maybe we can create, you know, we'll keep doing these longer form ones every quarter. We find many people really like to get this kind of, you know, overview of what are we thinking and what are we doing about it. Um, but I think if we can intersperse, you know, you doing one a month, that might be a fun thing to do. So anyway, thank you, Christian. I really appreciate you putting these charts and graphs together for us. Um, it's, I think this has been great insight, so thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. And for those of you watching, thank you again for being a client. Thank you for watching. And again, we're here if you need anything. Um, and with that, stay safe. Have a great day. Appreciate your time. Thanks, everyone.